At any moment, the armed forces of East and West are ready for war. Transmission mode rotary switch. Cable. I want to swap PLCA selector switches. Zero seven. Should our grudging peace ever falter, today's warriors can stage a battle far worse than anything our bloodstained world has ever seen. After all, it takes less than a minute to launch the missiles that could bring our civilization to a catastrophic end. Bravo. Bravo. Charlie. Charlie. The missiles must never be unleashed. We can all agree on that. So we'd better search out the routes that might lead to nuclear war. Return commit time. Three, two, one, mark. The long-range missiles of the opposing sides can dispatch nuclear warheads to 10,000 different targets. Unless mutual terror or good sense keep them in check, they may rise out of holes all across our northern lands and come bursting from the sea. And where would these missiles go? Well. The obvious targets are where people are, in cities. So the city dwellers have become the hostages of the threat and counter threat of nuclear war. And our nuclear nightmares begin with the destruction of lively and lovely cities like Paris, an emblem of civilization itself, and heaven knows where the nightmares end. A single nuclear bomb, easily spared from out of the huge arsenal of these things could lay the whole of central Paris to waste in an explosion much greater than that of Nagasaki or Hiroshima. The cosmic lunacy which produces such horror is not, as you might expect, the uh, affliction of irredeemably wicked men. No, it's part of carefully worked out and considered government policy. In the meanwhile, military accountants are working out how big a bang they can get for a buck, how much rubble for a ruble. Our dreams might be untroubled if this mutual terror had really managed to abolish war altogether, but unfortunately, the mutual nervousness causes the armed forces of all sides to jostle and probe each other and to shadow box within sight of their potential adversaries. Although the crew of a Soviet bomber acknowledges a point scored by the Western interceptor, the sparring would scarcely be keener if war had already begun. A British aircraft and a Russian warship. Today, they shoot only with cameras. While the Western submarine hunters play catch as catch can, for the Soviet boats, it's follow the leader. A helicopter from the cruiser Leningrad teases the American admiral who's sizing them up at unusually close quarters. Only the law of the high seas restrains this unfriendly game, and also, I trust, a healthy fear of the consequences if encounters should ever become conflicts. Will the Americans refrain from meeting taunt with taunt? I know, you see, they staged their little fly past too.
and it's in the same forceful spirit that a United States helicopter patrols the border of East Germany, the frontline ally of the Soviet Union. The white posts mark the end of the Western world, and the army pilot has been specially coached to fly within a few feet of them. It doesn't look like the most dangerous place on Earth, but all the outlandish firepower that's concentrated here, Russian, American, and British, could touch off a nuclear volcano at any time. The East German fences, set back a little from the border, delineate in suitably ugly fashion the geopolitical rift that runs right across Europe. If I negligently dropped my keys over here, I couldn't just run down and pick them up because they will have fallen into the other side of the world, into East Germany. I might as well throw them into the ocean. And this is how close the American cavalry is to this demarcation line at this observation post called Alpha. And in front of here and behind, great armies lie in wait for the war that must never happen, the new European war which could so easily get out of hand, involving not only thousands of tanks and planes, but eventually thousands of nuclear weapons. And this sinister arsenal is dedicated to the perpetuation of the ugly rift, across which young men in good health watch each other so warily. What's that you've seen over there? Our mission here is basically uh, to overwatch the East German border. It is to observe, record, and report all actions, whether it's an East German patrol walking past or walking right along the border, or whether it's a workforce on the border. My personal feelings are that I don't like it here. If there's any place in Europe that I want to be, it's right here on the border. Europe has a grim reputation for turning its pleasant hills into battlefields. If that ever happens again, these troops will take the first shock. It's been all quiet on the Central Front for most of the past 30 years. But all along the rift, the West Germans, the British, and other troops of the North Atlantic Alliance, NATO, face powerful opponents from the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. In this sector, where the East German border juts nearest to the Rhine, it's the Americans who stand at what soldiers call the sharp end, as the West's most forward defenders in case of trouble. It's uh, kind of strange looking out there and have them looking back at you, wondering what they're thinking and what they're doing and everything. But they've got a job just like we do. I don't know. There's times I'd like to talk to them, but there's, we can't. And I don't know. They just sit around and watch us when they see us. They go hide from us and stuff. I have talked to a few of the East German guards. Most of them are just soldiers like we are. The Americans are crack troops, all set to jump into their battle tanks and oppose any breach of the fateful frontier. We're always ready for a surprise attack. I have a unit that's always uh, positioned on the border. Uh, it's always man that can respond within less than 15 minutes. Uh, and all they have to do is call back here and the rest of us will respond very quickly.
So I've got 250 different combat systems here. They consist of tanks for my cavalry troops and my tank company, scouts vehicles mounted with the dragon weapon system, uh, ammunition trucks, uh, jeeps and command and control vehicles. We pack uh, one heck of a big punch, much larger punch than any other unit in the United States Army. These are 155 millimeter howitzers. They're capable of indirect fire support for the uh, squadron. We have different types of munitions, uh, high explosive. We have uh, rounds that will lay minefields and uh, drop bomblets, and they're also dual capable. They have a nuclear capability. Yeah, I think that the nuclear weapon is a great deterrent in the, uh, the political scene today. I think that the uh, you can see in the newspaper and in the news uh, how much it plays a, an important part in uh, everything that, that the, uh, is done with governments. And I think that us knowing that um, the other side has them and, and them knowing that we have them is, is a deterrent that um, is possibly one that will keep us from another war for a time. Apart from the guns that can fire nuclear shells, bombs of much greater power can be delivered out of the sky. Supersonic strike aircraft, stationed in England, for instance, are fully prepared for that dismal task. The crew can take their nuclear weapons to destinations anywhere in Europe, on the battlefield or far beyond it. The leaders of NATO see themselves increasingly outnumbered in planes and tanks. They doubt their ability to win a war in Europe by ordinary means. So, as their current statement of strategy declares, if NATO's conventional forces were in danger of defeat, selective and limited use of nuclear weapons could not be deferred. But to postpone for as long as possible any need to go nuclear, as they say, NATO looks to its conventional forces in Germany. The snag is, of course, that the Russians have nuclear weapons too. So aircraft specially built for fighting tanks might seem a more prudent defense than atomic artillery. The fighting men who profit from technology are liable to perish by it too. Even non-nuclear weapons are now so powerful that any war in Europe would be a competition in slaughter, swift and terrible to contemplate. Who'd want to meet a helicopter gunship leaping up before him? It's chock full of gadgets for dealing out death. The predictable violence of modern war drives the generals and their headquarters underground. The command bunkers are dotted all around Europe in unlikely places. For instance, at an American football stadium just west of the Rhine. Beneath the terraces, the staff officers secure themselves against chemical weapons and nuclear fallout. So it would, as it were, be a fight between one team of moles and another. They're sending off strike aircraft to help the ground troops. Thank goodness it's only an exercise. In the event there is a war here in Europe, uh, the primary mission of ATOC, SEMBOC, will be to task and coordinate offensive support, air support, for the U.S. and German Army Corps within the central region. For Oscar 902 was airborne 1232. Roger that, sir. Okay, Julia Charlie here at the ATOC. One Fox 602 Romeo. He was successful on target number 3 Victor 901. 523 will also follow the profile. If the battle's going badly and if the political leaders of the West consent, the commanders can replace their ordinary weapons with nuclear bombs. A contingency that is familiar to scholars of war. 
a nuclear war could arise in the first place from a Soviet attack on Western Europe. And indeed, NATO defenses quite deliberately have this nuclear risk built in as part of the deterrent. It is made clear to the Soviet Union that we cannot defend ourselves for very long without initiating the use of nuclear weapons, initially, hopefully on a small and local scale, but with every possibility that this would es escalate to ultimately a major nuclear exchange in which the territory of the Soviet Union itself should be at risk. Well, this is quite deliberate. It is part of the deterrent posture. If NATO fires any nuclear weapon, however small, then the Russians are almost certain to, certain to respond with nuclear weapons because their nuclear weapons, by and large, are rather vulnerable and therefore have to be used very early on in a, nu in, in a nuclear or even conventional war. And therefore, the, uh, the risk of escalation is enormous, I would say inevitable, and the escalation would be very rapid. And this would certainly lead to the total destruction of both sides. The build-up in the eastern side of Europe is a serious one, both in the purely conventional field and in the nuclear field. Perhaps one of the most serious aspects of it is that it doesn't seem to stop, in spite of the fact that you've had in the last decade a very tangible improvement of political relations. The Soviet military effort has not been affected by it. On the surface, it does appear that there is an enormous preponderance of Soviet forces in Europe and one of the arguments, of course, advanced is that these forces are too large for defensive purposes. Well, that, of course, is a statement from the Western side. It doesn't really take into account Soviet prescriptions. The Soviet argument is that they have a large and legitimate uh, defensive task to carry out in Europe as a whole. They have the defense of their own alliance system and, of course, their own perimeter. Europe is very large, north, central, and south. And they must also face a complexity of problems. Uh, from the Soviet point of view, they have not to deal only with uh, a NATO alliance, but there's always been the problem of the local adversary, something with which we have not had to deal. So therefore, from the Soviet side, they would argue that their forces are tailored exactly to discharge this defensive task. But it's the power for attack of those Soviet missiles and of armies much stronger than their own that perturbs the generals of NATO. They picture the Russian tanks bursting across the border and charging through West Germany, unstoppable by conventional forces. It's not at all obvious how such an attack could be in the Soviet interest, yet among the Western allies, the troubling vision persists. The NATO general on the Central Front happens himself to be a German. And in this nightmare, he might then see his own country turned into a radioactive battleground in the desperate bid to make the invaders go home before they reached the Rhine. Just let the unwholesome brew of tanks and bombs work on your imagination, and you may feel it closing in. The first of our nuclear nightmares to me, one possible sequence of events seems all too clear. They had to try and stop the advance somehow. You understand that, I hope. Uh, uh, this is the last of the coffee, I'm afraid. Who would have thought that the fallout would keep us down here for so long? Now, uh, there's something that I want you to believe. Uh, nobody actually intended your families to die like that. Or your school friends, for that matter. The German general in question, well, he was, put yourself in, in his shoes, if you will, for a moment. He was always opposed to the use of nuclear weapons. In fact, he said, do you want me to be tried like a war criminal, like others were before me? But on the first day, Soviet armor had advanced 40 miles into West Germany. On the second day, 80 miles, and it was then that the American Supreme Commander told the German general, we are going to stop this war with nuclear weapons. Uh, your Chancellor and my President are in full agreement about this. 
So it's come to this, said the German general. Well, at least, thank God, it won't be my decision. Oh, but it will, my friend. We want you to select the targets. Oh, there must be some other way. If I could uh, swing the Netherland Corps round onto the flank. But the subordinates were getting impatient, although the British general was stiff-lipped. There's quite a lot of blood flowing up here, although we've managed to nudge uh, his armor into a nuclear fire zone quite effectively. Put in a good word for us. There's a good chap. Uh, nuclear fire zone, including villages, farms, people, civilians. The American commander was adamant. We are going to accomplish eight nuclear strikes uh, on armored spearheads of your choice, and we are going to send eight uh, missions uh, in the rear in Czechoslovakia and East Germany. You see, the Americans calculated that they could smash the Soviet armor at the same time saving New York and Chicago. Not Cologne and Munich, unfortunately. You remember the postcard I showed you of Cologne Cathedral? It's a very beautiful one it was. A German corps commander, almost surrounded, added his voice to the rest. Mein General, warum wollen Sie mich in Stich lassen? Why am I being abandoned like von Paulus in Stalingrad? Where are the nuclear weapons? So, at length, the German general consented very well, although may my tongue rot for saying so. Oh, you know, you know the targets in any case. And so, the Germans and the Americans were in full accord, and in the morning of the third day, the first bombs lit up the skyline like a false dawn. Although, as the German general had said all along, why on earth would the Russians back down when they're winning? And of course, when the Russians didn't back down, there was no logical time or place for the nuclear exchanges to cease. Would there be any European cities exempt from devastation? Well, some nations believe that the possession of a nuclear force of their own makes them safer and that the hostage cities could in some sense hit back. The French, for instance, hope that the possession of such a nuclear force exempts Paris, makes it immune from the nuclear epidemic. But have things changed so much since the Elysee Palace here was occupied by Louis XV's mistress Madame de Pompadour, whose contemporary Voltaire wrote so scathingly about the heroic butchery of war. Well, I wonder what Voltaire might have thought of the President of the French Republic, who now lives in the Elysee, controlling from his basement enough nuclear power to carry destruction thousands of miles away. In the most elegant of headquarters, he has enough power at his beck and call to make the war of the Austrian succession seem like an outing, like a picnic. And because an enemy might have similar power, France puts her command posts underground too. You don't have to be a superpower to build nuclear bombs but you'd be well advised to assemble the computerized paraphernalia of modern war, as France has done, and guard your bombs with care. A nuclear weapon, author of nightmares, and, so the French hope, a discouragement to potential enemies. It's hard to grasp that the gleaming object has so much death in it to be scattered indiscriminately by heat, blast, fire and atomic radiation. But we'd deceive ourselves if we didn't see that the French are really rather proud of the standing attached to the possession of the bomb. After all, who isn't?
Their supersonic bombers represent only one of the methods that the French employ for fighting or threatening to fight a nuclear war. They have ballistic missiles too, entirely homemade, here going by road under plain cover to a base in the south of the country. The missiles à la maison are capable of hurling H-bombs as far as Moscow, for instance, or over any lesser distance. The key that could do it makes an unusual halter. Bonjour. Bonjour. Merci la clé. Merci. C'est normal. Tout est normal. Nous sommes en alerte en bleu. The weapons are meant to deter any nuclear attack and warn all comers that the French won't be walked over next time. Avari 8600, pan vector, exécuté CTP 03. They could also help to shield Western Europe. So the French spare no expense in keeping their missiles up to scratch. But they don't want all the rest of the world joining the nuclear club. Their tour de force you'll find at Brest. The submarines that skulk under the sea, each carrying 16 missiles. They could easily obliterate the chief cities of any enemy. But if the French think they need them, why not everyone? Why not Brazilian missile submarines or Korean nuclear bombers? The United States first made the bomb for fear of Hitler. Then Russia, fearing the Americans. Next came the British, their nuclear submarines and bombers now loyally assigned to NATO. Then France, firmly asserting her independence. The Chinese who followed think that nuclear war is bound to come. Inevitably, perhaps, it was India's bomb next. By all accounts, Israel now possesses the bomb, and perhaps South Africa too while Pakistan is striving to follow suit. So the bomb is proliferating through the hotter regions of the world, despite all the efforts of the diplomats to prevent it. Will the seven or eight who have it so far soon be 18 and then 80? There's a new form of racism which suggests that nuclear weapons are respectable, but only for rich, predominantly white countries. After all, it's rather grand to be a superpower. You can continue to improve your weapons while preaching piously about peace. If you're a smaller nation with only a very few nuclear weapons, then I'm afraid this is irresponsible, if not criminal. Well, whether there is or not any wisdom at all in this hypocrisy, proliferation would seem to point a second way towards a holocaust this time through the less affluent parts of the world. And the greatest danger of all lies here in the narrow streets of the Middle East, where modern technology serves ancient bitterness. The global bazaar for nuclear merchandise is not easy to police, and anyone can equip himself for making bombs. We and, and the Soviets have set a very bad example to the rest of the world in essentially demonstrating that uh, nuclear weapons are the, the main instrument of our foreign policy. And, and essentially are the, the main support of our status as a superpower. Well, that being the case, it's awfully difficult to convince anybody else not to have them. All these countries that are interested in the acquisition of nuclear weapons have generally hostile neighbors. You know? And you have what you call uh, odd couples in you know, a country A and country B, and you have some examples, for example, in Asia, in South Asia, that are very hostile and are both interested in nuclear weapons. It's quite clear that if country A decides to acquire nuclear weapons, country B will follow the example. And so you, uh, a very dangerous nuclear arms threats would be triggered. Well, I was astounded that the United States government has declassified so much information that's available at places here like the Library of Congress 
uh, that a single competent individual could easily design fission bombs and I think carry them through to construction. There's no doubt in my mind that a small group of motivated, organized people, even perhaps people not very highly technically trained, just terrorists, could conceive and bring to fruition a nuclear weapons construction project. Any country to date that has decided to develop a bomb, a crude, maybe crude, fission bomb, has been successful on the first try. So looking in the future, I don't expect to see countries actually detonate their first weapon. I think that they will know whether or not they are in a position to have a weapon. Clearly, the, the collected wisdom of the world is that Israelis, Israel has a bomb, but they've never tested it. Uh, and I think that's what you're going to see in the future. Spies and nuclear experts seem to agree it's a demona that Israel makes her bombs, even though the signs would have it otherwise. The plant itself has been kept from prying eyes for years. But won't Israel's nuclear effort simply spur her enemies along the same road? The holy city of Christians, Jews, and Muslims, the order is strictly alphabetical, it has been the focal point for conflict for thousands of years. Jerusalem is at this time in Israeli hands, but you can look north towards the Soviet Union with its Muslim minorities and affiliations, east towards a patchwork of Muslim states, patient yet unforgiving, south towards Mecca, the power of religion and of oil, and west towards America, Israel's powerful friend. It is hard to see how an eventual nuclear anarchy can be avoided in this area. Already, in, in very few years, several states could have bombs of their own, to say nothing of certain minority groups. Even with a bomb smaller than that of Hiroshima, maddened men could be responsible for hundreds and thousands of deaths, a tragedy which would be attributable to man's folly or here to the wrath of God. I don't suppose we'll ever really know who blew up Jerusalem. Oh, nowadays, it seems as long ago as uh, the fall of Babylon, doesn't it? At the time, it perplexed and alarmed the Israeli prime minister and horrified him as it did everyone else. Oh, I wish people wouldn't cut up newspapers. You know, they're relics for students of history, even for amateurs like myself, who are trying to imagine how this war began. Oh, talking about amateurs, the Israeli Secret Service was very active at the time that the amateurs first got hold of the bomb. Uh, just after those first two uh, hideous explosions, bungled explosions at Belfast and at Lisbon. Uh, the Israelis, uh, where is it? It's here, sir. Oh, yes. An Israeli government spokesman said, we warned the British and Portuguese authorities that nuclear weapons were now circulating among unofficial groups. Well, Israel's own problems were about to start on that Sunday, or... No, I know, it must have been, it must have been the Monday when two El Al airliners were shot down by missiles and Ben Gurion Airport was subsequently closed. Uh, the Secretary of State remonstrated, the Soviets are supplying Middle Eastern countries with surface-to-air missiles of unnecessary sophistication. And the Israelis immediately plunged into the Lebanon for the umpteenth time. But now, to report catastrophic losses to their prime minister and the fact that they had lost control of the air, there will be a time for mourning later, said the Israeli prime minister to the Knesset. He didn't know how much mourning. For on the Wednesday, a small nuclear device blew up the ancient walled city of Jerusalem with its predominantly Arabic population and all its holy places, while the, uh, the, the news of this act of folly was still reverberating around the world. Uh, it could be supposed that the Israeli prime minister was saying, how do we retaliate? 
Who do I hit? But his advisors were as baffled as he. The next day, on television, the Palestinian leader, in tears, said, why should we destroy our national home, the place that we have cherished and suffered for for so long? We are not mad. But, of course, there were those that did claim responsibility for this hideous act. Uh, various groups, uh, the Lisbon Red Heroes, Dark December, others too numerous and too psychotic to mention. The American and the Soviet fleets converged on the coast while their governments remained in contact, attempting to, as they said, defuse the Middle East. The Israeli Prime Minister protested, the superpowers are trying to take even our tragedies out of our hands. And, and what's this you tell me about Saudi Arabian bombers on Amman airfield? I want an Entebbe-like raid. I want you to seize all the nuclear devices they have. But the commandos were blown out of the air. The Prime Minister saw the net closing. What? The Libyans have agreed to give nuclear bombs to the Lebanese? The Pakistanis have already done so to the Syrians? Trembling for his cities, the Israeli Prime Minister authorized nuclear strikes against a man, Damascus. Yes, and Beirut, he cried. And so, on the eve of Sabbath, in that subcontinent of prophets, cataclysms began to rival the book of Revelations. And since the superpowers were unable to disentangle themselves, the madness eventually engulfed us all. The Americans and the Russians are at pains to avoid war by mishap. And for this, they employ military intelligence, uh, high-speed communication, and very complicated systems of what they call command and control. Any loss of control would automatically entail a third route into a nuclear war. Uh, these controls are, of course, uh, very highly guarded secrets. But what is fairly obvious is that the systems themselves would come under immediate attack in the event of hostilities. And here, uh, Filingdale's Moor in the north of England would probably be hit in the first few minutes. Why? Because it has become one of the nostrils of the American high command, endlessly sniffing the air for signs of danger. And inside those round objects are radars which warn of the approach of ballistic missiles. Meanwhile, high above the Earth, there are satellites looking out for the first glow of rocket engines. And it's in the frozen north that the other early warning outposts stand. That's because the missile flight paths between the superpowers would mainly pass this way. The giant radars never rest in Greenland or here in Alaska. The military planners believe, or pretend to believe, that a missile attack might burst upon the United States at any time. In that event, they'd have less than half an hour's notice before the nuclear warheads arrived at their targets. So the news from the big radars goes straight to Colorado and the chief defenders of a continent who man their headquarters at Cheyenne Mountain day and night. The North American Air Defense Command, usually known as NORAD. Because they're so vital for command and control, the NORAD staff put 1,400 feet of granite between themselves and the fragile world outside. And NORAD's computers would announce any massive attack, where it's coming from, and what's more to the point, where the missiles can be expected to fall. The uh, detection would be almost instantaneous. 
Uh, the reliability is very high. The warning time, of course, would depend on where the missile was launched from, since it's a matter of flight time of the missile. And the same way with the submarine, uh, the warning time then would depend on where the submarine was when he launched. Attacks upon the sensors could make us blind and deaf. Uh, but we have overlapping and redundant systems, and to knock them all out would be a sizable effort, and to do so would be considered an act of war. Even in peacetime, the radar outposts have plenty to do, reporting to NORAD on all the satellites that circle the Earth. Most of them have warlike functions, and some could make mischief. The watchers see the superpowers using spacecraft more and more for military command and control. They rely on them for spying, for early warning, for their worldwide communications. They are tempting targets indeed. And from time to time, NORAD spots anti-satellite devices under test. 10382, the current L set is 485. Every medium that man has entered before, uh, he has found ultimately some way to conduct warfare in it. Now, whether or not there's going to be warfare in space, I think, is more a matter for mankind to decide. For those of us still stranded on this planet, the chain of command comes to its bitter end with a missile cruise. On the windy plains of North Dakota, they never know that the president's order won't come today to fire their missiles in anger. But how can anyone make certain that they'll never shoot without authority and yet never fail to shoot if their nation requires it? When the crews change their shifts, the brother officers are cool and punctilious. You ready to brief for status? Okay. LCB status is normal. Very good. Uh, communication status. The radios are all operational. Okay. Uh, launch switches. Okay. Check the launch switch. First over here. Launch switch. The new commander won't take charge of the missiles until he's given the control capsule a thorough inspection. There must be no funny business down here with a world at stake. It's good. Okay. You check the keys already? Yeah. Okay. You want to check our locks and make sure they work? Well, on, there's your log. Okay. You guys have a good one. Okay. okay. Have a good one. Second trip back. Take care. See you tomorrow. All right. Let's go on our inspection. On these young men falls direct responsibility for 30 H-bombs, the warheads of 10 Minuteman missiles of intercontinental range. Once the missiles have gone, they can't be called back. This is the launch checklist. Step one, launch keys inserted. Even here, presumably safe from all intruders, the keys that can unlock death for millions of people are not left lying around. And to launch the missiles, two are not enough. Concerned command. Concerned deputy. The four key system is a system used to ensure the correct launch and authorized launch of the Minuteman missile force. Four keys is the minimum amount required to launch any Minuteman missile. Two keys are in each capsule, one for the deputy and one for myself, the commander. When we turn our keys together, we constitute one launch vote. Our one launch vote, combined with the one launch vote of another launch control center to which we're electrically connected, allows, allows the four key system to come into effect and constitutes an authorized launch command. In the event an unauthorized command is sent, we have what we call an inhibit launch command, which is used to cancel out the unauthorized order. Enable. Press illuminated. This is Alpha, and we need a key turn in five seconds. Bravo. Charlie, you got it. Okay, launch switch. Hands on keys. Three, two, one, mark. Key turn. I have one gone, two is missile away. Four is gone. In order to become a missile air, you have to be very carefully screened. 
Any person who exhibits unstable behavior, such as a heavy drinking problem or develops a serious marital problem or something more personal, he would be removed from duty. Only the uh, most mentally fit and prepared people are permitted to pull missile alert duty and SAC bomber duty. The missiles and bombers of SAC, Strategic Air Command, are controlled from an underground command post here at Omaha, Nebraska. Launching the missiles usually requires proper orders relayed from the highest in the land, but the SAC command post may not be buried deep enough to escape destruction. Indeed, attacks on key headquarters might leave the superpower like a beheaded dragon, unable to strike back. An unusual aircraft tries to avoid that outcome. Anticipating the chaos of nuclear war, the generals of SAC take turns in providing another channel of command in the comparative safety of the air. It has a code name, Looking Glass. This airborne command post, which has been flying, or an airplane similar to this for the past 17 years, offers our commander-in-chief and the national command authorities a method to maintain connectivity or communications with all the organizations that we are responsible for within the Strategic Air Command. We will never be caught unawares. We'll always be able to maintain communications between the National Command Authorities and the Strategic Air Command Forces. Aboard several of our airplanes, including this particular airplane, we have the ability to launch the Minuteman missiles if in fact circumstances on the ground would prevent them from being launched under execution orders from the National Command Authorities. The reasoning is straightforward. In this looking glass, stranger far than Alice's, we see a disturbing sight. The pilots looking down on ruination, on incinerated cities, military targets crushed, an airborne general awaiting orders from the senior surviving member of the government, orders to wreak similar havoc on the enemy. It is by images of horror such as these that the superpowers seek to deter each other. But the very fact of the existence of headquarters in the sky like these acknowledges the frailty of other elements in command and control. And the frailest of all these elements are human beings. Yes, Brentford. Yes, this is on position 3-3. Looking Glass itself might lack authority if no word came from the president. So he too has an emergency command post, a jumbo jet with the improbable name of Kneecap. It can whisk the president and his military chiefs out of harm's way if they make it to the airfield in time. The command system, uh, because it depends upon fragile communication assets and a very few people is extremely vulnerable to itself to attack. Uh, so a first strike on a command system uh, gives the probability of seriously degrading the military capability of, of the uh, of force that is attacked. Uh, modern command systems understand that fact. Uh, given all this, uh, in the midst of a crisis in which uh, military commanders believe that a war can no longer be avoided uh, because the preparations have gone too far. There would be extreme pressures to go the full way and to, to get in, if not the first attack, certainly to establish basic military plans uh, and bring their forces right up to the actual brink of war. The same knotty issues of command and control beset the Soviet Union's strategic rocket force. Anyone who might find himself at the receiving end of a Russian missile would naturally hope their precautions against any unauthorized launch are at least as strict as the Americans. 
but Soviet missile officers, like their American counterparts, know that in a nuclear war, their systems of command and control would be targets of the highest priority. They're quite aware that communications can fail, headquarters can be atomized, political leaders and generals can perish. Soviet anxieties mirror those of the United States. The need to avoid being caught unawares in a surprise attack, to be sure of getting the big missiles away before the chain of command snaps. But how do they arrange these matters on the other side of the balance of terror? I don't know if there is a difference in vulnerability between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, but there certainly is a difference in their style of operation with respect to command and control. Uh, the difference has to do with the basic nature of these two, two societies. The United States is a highly decentralized society, and so are its military forces. A great deal of dependence upon the initiative of low-level commanders under actual uh, uh, for, uh, operations of military forces. Soviet Union is a highly centralized society, and so are its military forces. Uh, they have gone to extraordinary effort, as far as we can tell, to maintain that central authority, even to the point of trading off against the vulnerability of their actual force elements. The trickiest of all forces to control are the submarines, whose missiles are the superpower's last resort. But in time of war, will the commands ever reach them? The American sailors casting off from Holy Lock in Scotland won't see daylight again for two months. And communicating with submarines underwater is difficult enough in peacetime. I really do not know what kind of orders the United States missile submarines operate under. However, we can realize that the vulnerability of their communication links require that a great deal of authority be vested in the submarine commander and the officers and men serving underneath him. In circumstances in which it became apparent that the United States had been attacked massively and their communication links had been broken and could not be reestablished, the submarine commander would have to decide whether to execute the missions for which he had been prepared despite the lack of formal authority to do so, or whether he should fail to do so and uh, possibly degrade the retaliatory capability of the United States. I don't think it's predictable in advance how a submarine commander would resolve this problem, but everybody recognizes that there are circumstances in which he would virtually have to do so, and some of them undoubtedly would. I think the same logic does apply to the Soviet submarines, uh, but I personally believe that, uh, that they do not operate under quite the extension of authority that, that is characteristic of the United States force. Indeed, I believe that's why there are uh, observable operational restrictions on, on Soviet submarines. Uh, at any given time, they have many fewer of them at sea uh, and they do not operate as, uh, quite as far from the Soviet Union as the United States submarines do from the United States. Uh, I simply believe they've solved the problem in a different way. They are willing to accept some greater vulnerability of their submarines in order to uh, a, a, achieve tighter operational control. I know very little about submarines, but I imagine that their crews are as cramped and as isolated as we are here. Uh, cut off. I'm thinking in particular of the captain of a Soviet submarine selected for a long-range mission in the Pacific because of his proven loyalty to the party and also because of his quality as a seaman. Now, he had lost touch with his base for days. His second-in-command told him nothing from the shore transmitter at Khabarovsk, nothing from the emergency aircraft. The captain addressed the crew. Comrades, perhaps our mother Russia has been burnt to a cinder already and we're the only ones left to avenge her. But my orders are specific. I must have proof that nuclear war has broken out before I take any initiative. We should surface 
sample the atmosphere, listen for news broadcasts. But there were three unidentified ships bearing down on him already. Three destroyers, comrade captain, and a possible submarine. Hmm. If they sink us, we shall have the proof we need, grunted the captain. And if I launch my missiles, the chances are they'll sink us anyway. But why should they provoke us like this if they have not attacked the Soviet Union? Oh, we provoke each other all the time in this war of nerves. That's nothing. But comrade captain, Khabarovsk, the emergency aircraft, the captain took his decision. I will launch two missiles. In this way, if it's a terrible mistake, the party chairman can always say to the American president, that stupid captain, we've punished him. Uh, we apologize about Denver and San Diego. If it isn't a mistake, we shall have done our duty in part at least. But we would never start a war ourselves, cried the second in command. Remember what the admiral said? The crew cheered quietly. There are certain circles in Washington eager to destroy us. Are two missiles sufficient? Two missiles, said the captain. Proceed. And so he remained poised on a balance of error, not knowing whether he had started a nuclear war or merely stoked fires that were raging already. When bomber crews scramble, it certainly sounds like the end of the world. Memories of the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor nearly 40 years ago still haunt American strategies. So they always keep a hundred aircraft on alert, laden with nuclear weapons. Otherwise, a sudden strike by missiles might annihilate the entire bomber force on the ground. So if the warning comes, the crews scurry into the air. An attack of that sort would be yet another way for a nuclear war to start. One superpower or the other coming to believe it can or must strike first. The aim being to cripple the other's nuclear forces, embodied in bombers, missiles, and submarines. Any of them, sooner or later, could well be vulnerable to attack. Even if the somewhat elderly B-52s get airborne in time, won't they just be shot down before they reach their targets? Not all manned bombers are necessarily vulnerable. They have become increasingly vulnerable as time goes on because, for example, the Soviet Union has developed um, an anti-aircraft system that essentially layers the, the, the air above the, uh, the ground and addresses each layer with a different weapon. Therefore, they sort of have covered the entire range in which a bomber could fly with a different kind of weapon. And that seems to be reasonably uh, lethal. On the other hand, a bomber has ways to confuse the radars, for example, of the anti-aircraft system and thereby uh, be able to penetrate with um, less uh, danger and threat uh, than, than one would normally expect. The best way, of course, to do that is avoid the the defenses, and that's where the cruise missile comes in. The cruise missile can be launched from, from a bomber and, and travel very near the ground, where it will probably hide in the clutter, in the noise that, that the ground gen generates in a radar. Therefore, be able to penetrate much more easily than a large bomber like a B-52 then the bomber does not have to approach the, the dangerous areas that are defended, and therefore its survivability is increased. The equation of survivability versus penetrability goes back and forth. I mean, uh, you, 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 you devise a new weapon, then for, for a while you have the ability to penetrate and hit a target. 
the, the other fellow who is interested in defending the target eventually defines a countermeasure to that. Then, of course, you come around and you define a new weapon that takes care of that countermeasure. And it is this measure-countermeasure uh, situation that you are really uh, encountering in, in military operations, in, 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 in bombing or in anything like that. So it is, it is perhaps misleading to say that, that the bomber is, is uh, inexorably vulnerable and, and, and uh, will, you know, will be eliminated from the face of the earth. The superpowers wouldn't trust their destinies to just one method of hitting each other. That's why, scattered across the countryside, the intercontinental missiles stand in their buried launchers. The Americans have a thousand. But would they survive in a nuclear battle? Would the airborne commander in his looking glass aircraft have anything left to launch? Once through the looking glass, we find the garden of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And if the order should come from strategic air command or from the looking glass aircraft, then the massive lid on which I'm standing would be thrown aside and a Minuteman missile would come roaring out. This is a silo in the military rather than in the agricultural sense. And there are over a hundred of them in the farmland in this part of North Dakota. But each Minuteman has three separate nuclear warheads concealed in its nose, each aimed at a different target. And now that the big Russian missiles, too, have several re-entry vehicles apiece, swarms of powerful and accurate warheads might, in theory, rain down on the silos and destroy most of the Minuteman force. If the duel of missile against missile becomes plausible, the side that shoots first might gravely weaken the other. Unless, of course, the victim hurriedly launches his own missiles before they're hit. Missiles are being tested now from test sites into the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean. And the same thing is the case in the Soviet Union. Neither country, I believe, have tested missiles from operational silos with operational crews over the um, trajectory they're going to follow in, in, in time of war. Therefore, we don't really know what's going to happen. If you try to launch a thousand missiles over half an hour and send them all cross-targeted against a thousand silos, this kind of extremely complex process that obviously, like all technical and, 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 uh, and technological processes, will have bugs in it, has never been tested, has never been rehearsed even. Therefore, it seems to me to, to say with any degree of certainty that indeed the missile is going to perform as we expected is simply not true. I certainly believe the Soviet Union has taken advantage of Minuteman vulnerability in the past through the development of their large, heavy SS-18 missiles. I certainly think they will take advantage of it in the future. As a matter of fact, I think it's their number one goal to be able to launch first strikes wiping out 90% of our Minuteman three force. I don't think they'll do it dramatically or cause any great public concern, but over a period of time through the mid-1980s, they will take advantage of our Minuteman III vulnerability. The Soviet Union may, within two or three years, have enough accurate re-entry vehicles technically to destroy 90% of the Minuteman silos. That doesn't mean that they can destroy the missiles. They could be launched before they were destroyed. It doesn't mean that the Soviet Union would do what they are technically capable of doing. They would use more missiles, more reentry vehicles than they would destroy. Uh, they would still have to face the submarine-launched ballistic missiles and the air-launched cruise missiles. It makes no sense for the Soviet Union to destroy only a small component of the U.S. strategic force. One of the first things the president has to decide when he's elected and takes that oath of office, what will he do if uh, he is told with no question, no uh, lack of confirmation, that there is a 500,000 missile attack on our Minuteman field. He shouldn't have to uh, say, gee, I never thought of that, uh, let's form a committee. I think as soon as he takes office, he'd better make up his mind what he's going to do. 
If he's done that, then he's either going to launch or he's not going to launch. If he's not going to launch, then clearly the missiles are at risk. If he decides that he will launch before the adversary's missiles arrive, then they're no longer at risk. And I would think that if he has made such a decision and it's understood, that is part of the overall deterrent. If the worst came to the worst, what would actually happen? Well, this question exercises well-informed experts and well-informed computers, both here in Washington and elsewhere. And they fight imaginary wars and try to assess how many people would be killed and what damage would be done on both sides. And these activities are called war games. Any number can play. The outcome is always disastrous, with tens or hundreds of millions of dead. Yet nowadays the war games of the superpowers often commence with one team making a hopeful strike at the other's nuclear forces. The simple idea of avoiding a nuclear war by deterrence is being eroded by notions on fighting and winning quickly without suffering unduly in the process. A question of a judicious selection of targets. If our enemy is really the Soviet state and its leaders, uh, murdering, you know, murdering Soviet children is not, to my mind, where our strategy ought to be. Also, I think it's, it's militarily and politically foolish, but it's not the kind of promise of damage that the Soviets should find most deterring. The kind of damage they would find most deterring is loss of their military power, loss of their ability to control their country politically. But we cannot even begin to think hard about what kind of target sets we should strike for that unless we at the same time recognize that we have to be able to limit the damage they can do to us. Because no matter how intelligent a targeting, set of targeting suggestions I can give you for our forces. If the Soviets can kill 100 or 120 million Americans within a few days of, of, of the beginning of World War III, any reasonable American president who isn't drunk, drugged, or just insane uh, you know, would not be able to exercise offensive strategic options because of what they could do to us. We will be self-deterred. We have to have a strategy from which we are not self-deterred. The Soviet argument about deterrence is this, very simply, that if deterrence fails, then you go over to limiting the damage upon your own country. And indeed, in military preparation terms, you take all measures to minimize that, even if it should include striking first at a potential enemy. But are Russia's own forces any safer from attack? The missile submarines after the bombers and land-based missiles are the third main branch of the superpower's nuclear forces. They're intended always to survive for the final revenge. But every Soviet submarine leaving its base at Murmansk attracts attention from the submarine hunters of the West. If it's bound for the Atlantic, it passes under the eyes of the Norwegian Air Force. And they're just the first of its uninvited escorts, these watchful men of Norway. In keeping track of Soviet submarines, the Allies in NATO use all the skills and resources they can command. Could their superior technology put the missile submarine fatally at risk? The submarine's not well hidden, even if it dives. When the Norwegians alert their British colleagues, a Nimrod aircraft will pick up the trail. In the Bible, Nimrod was the mighty hunter. It's mainly concern that the large Soviet fleet of ordinary submarines might one day run riot through the shipping in the Atlantic, which prompts this diligence. The submarine can't avoid making a noise as it travels. If they're searching for it in the right patch of sea, it'll give away its position when the RAF men sew their sound detectors in the water. As the readings come in by radio, they have contact. So the Russian submarine finds itself in a chase that's disconcertingly realistic. Our boys are in the water then. The submarine somewhere is on the north of the line of boys. And we're expecting them to do a The submarine will try to shake off its pursuers, but a string of secret and ultra-sensitive sound detectors lies in ambush across its path, all the way from Britain to Greenland. Thereafter, it engages the interest of the United States Navy with their clever airborne instruments. 
They track it relentlessly. This is what passes for peace in our time. And when the flyers return to their carrier, a computer devours their recording. Okay, Lieutenant Sandberg. The machine refreshes its knowledge of the submarines at sea. It can always recall their last positions. So the Russian submariners can never feel safely out of sight of the Western navies. At the start of a war, many could be promptly sunk. And they might include some of the missile-carrying boats, which form an essential part of the Soviet nuclear deterrent. The executioner could be another submarine, an attack submarine or hunter-killer. The American Navy has fearsome craft of this sort. And they can hound their prey wherever it goes. For the coup de grace, they can strike with anti-submarine missiles and homing torpedoes. American arms control officials have argued that these thoroughgoing systems of anti-submarine warfare could well sap the Russians' confidence in the submarine branch of their deterrent. So just as the West abhors the growing power and accuracy of Soviet intercontinental missiles, Soviet leaders may be alarmed by increasing Western ingenuity. An ominous interplay, because sooner than any hope of victory, it is fear of defeat that might impel that fatal first blow. I've no doubt at all that the political administration in the United States and the political administration in the Soviet Union have, in, in academic terms, no wish at all to have a nuclear world war. I'm convinced of that. But the technology will make it almost inevitable that the politicians decide to do it in order to stop the other side, which they trust very little, in doing it to them. And it's this reason which is, is so dangerous for world security. Anybody who can count up to five will tell you that that building over there is the Pentagon. Well, tabloid newspapers like nothing better on fallow days than to publish pictures of cats and dogs in perfect harmony playing innocently together. It seems to prove that instinctive antagonisms can be countered with a little patience. Superpowers also have instinctive antagonisms by virtue of their size, their influence, their power. And they adopt aggressive postures before uh, any calmer counsel can prevail. Well, how can harmony be brought to superpowers? First of all, it's essential for them to understand each other's point of view. You are seeing the world there from the point of view of the West. I, over here, from my surrounded position, see it from the point of view of the Soviet Union. And I seem to sense from here, from being surrounded, I seem to sense your aggressions, I seem to sense your paranoia even and your fear. Why? Because of your troops and listening stations in Alaska, throughout the Arctic Circle, down Europe, across Turkey, Iran, where a hole was driven into the hedge only the other day with characteristic outcry. Afghanistan, where the hole was punctured in the other direction. China, with its offer to the United States to compensate for the lost listening posts in Iran and back to Alaska again. And there is nothing in history to reassure me from here. After all, they remember only too well that in 1917, feeble expeditionary forces from the United States, Britain and France landed in order to attempt to thwart the 1917 revolution. They did nothing in point of fact but give the Red Army its first battle honors and its first experience against foreign troops. You may remember how exercised the United States was when there were Soviet missiles on Cuba. Well, what would be the position of the United States and of the entire West, I wonder, if there were Soviet troops and listening devices all along the Canadian border, all along the Mexican border, and throughout the Caribbean? We must remember and remember solemnly that a cornered animal and a cornered man are the least open to appeal. There comes a moment 
when the terrible lucidity of desperation takes over. And then there is no way back. Of course, the historians, or whatever historians there are left, will always find it extremely difficult to decide whether it was on the pecan pie or the blueberry tart that the American president so nearly choked himself when he first got the news of the missile attack. And what is perhaps even more difficult to attribute is the blame for the end of the world as we knew it. As the president himself said when he recovered his breath, Maybe we shouldn't have gone on alert. Well, on day one, Washington asked Moscow to stop fighting the Chinese and also asked Peking to stop fighting the Russians. But on day two, the Chinese suddenly announced that the Americans were now their allies. The path to peace lies through the tunnel of nuclear confrontation, they proclaimed. Uh, the Americans denied this. The American president said, as far as we're concerned, both sides are communists. On day three, the Russians set in motion a huge civil defense exercise. That is scary, said the Americans, and put their bombers on generated alert. The Americans are warmongering, said the Russians, and sent their submarines out to sea. In an effort to bring down the temperature, the American president left his command center and ostentatiously undertook all sorts of civilian duties and ended the day with a civilian supper which was interrupted. I want an immediate decision to execute, said the Secretary of Defense. To execute? He has to shoot, to launch, to get the missiles off the ground where they can't be dug out. Those aren't cans of caviar they're sending over, sir. NORAD predicts 2,000 warheads aimed specifically at our nuclear bases, at our missile bases and our bomber bases. The general stakes his life on that data. Well, I wasn't the general's life I was thinking about specifically, said the, uh, said the um, president, although uh, I, I gotta believe him. Can, can we just hit their missiles? Oh, no, you'd just be wasting your force on empty silos. That's what we can do to him if we hurry. The Secretary of State spoke up. If you should choose to do nothing, sir, you'd certainly have my support. I realize that millions of us are going to be killed, but if we retaliate, why, that's the end of everything. No, said the Secretary of Defense. He's gambling on our holding back. Well, if the President was listening to these arguments, he showed no sign of it. We hit their silos and they hit our, oh no, they hit our silos, we hit their cities and they hit our cities. I guess the bullets left the rifle, huh? Now all you have to say is Tripoli, sir, said the defense secretary. Yeah. Tripoli. Execute, you have the word of the commander in chief. Do the people know what's happening, said the president as he was hurried to safety. Oh, yes, sir, they're getting it, uh, they're getting it all on, uh, on television. One, go to a public fallout shelter. Know where the nearest one is. To your office, your home, your children's school. If you decide to take shelter at home, know how to improvise and improve your protection there. Everybody wants to avoid the big war. Of course they do, but how? For as long as anyone can remember, Switzerland here has been the main talking shop for peace and disarmament. And here in Geneva, at the Palace of the Nations, the negotiators now talk of nuclear submarines and napalm, where they once talked of battleships and bayonets. And in their uh, embassies, in their villas, in their hotels, the negotiators struggle through glaciers of talk and mountain ranges of paper with exemplary patience. What drives them on? It is the hope 
that among all this, there may be the magic words, the magic few pages, which will save millions of lives. I wish I could report that our Swiss hosts have the greatest confidence in these negotiations, but they are, by nature, a cautious people. And they have hedged their bets in quite an expensive way. Like the Chinese, who've covered their land with a rabbit warren of protective tunnels, the Swiss are resolved that they will survive any nuclear holocaust which happens to drift this way. Switzerland, owing to her special status, is hardly likely to be the object of direct attack from any quarter. But whereas bombs may recognize neutrality, fallout has no such scruples. Every man not assigned to the army is forced to serve in Switzerland's civil defense. And the men in the very sinister suits behind me or well, they could be engineers, factory workers, or clerks, practicing here in Geneva's civil defense school. By law, every new house built in Switzerland has to have uh, purpose-built, in the very foundations, a shelter as a protection against nuclear war. But uh, be warned, this nation of fine hotels and boarding houses makes no special provision for foreign tourists, nor indeed for the foreign negotiators in Geneva, should their missions fail. The local government has a larger and stronger shelter from which it would continue to administer the canton in the event of fallout drifting across from France, Germany or Italy or a few misguided missiles actually falling on Swiss soil. Yes, I always suspected that the last survivor would be a bureaucrat. But actually, the Swiss are more active and more determined in civil defense than any of the countries engaged in the nuclear confrontation, whose populations are asked to trust the nuclear strategy of their governments enshrined, of course, in the principle of deterrence. Deterrence has worked so far because of the fact that no aggressor could contemplate starting a nuclear war and gaining any advantage. Any aggressor would be faced with the fact that for him to start a nuclear exchange would mean a national suicide. It's also worked because both sides recognize that they have the retaliatory forces that provide that deterrent. And therefore, they don't have to start a, an exchange out of fear, out of fear that their deterrent would be destroyed. Now, as long as those factors continue to exist, deterrence will continue to exist. And that, of course, is one of the purposes of arms control, to preserve that situation of strategic stability. We have, at most of the time, since the end of World War II, have had nuclear superiority. So the Soviet Union did not dare attack us. I think today we have what we would call rough equivalence or parity. The Soviet Union would not attack. But if we allow them through treaties or through our own decisions of cutting back our forces unilaterally to achieve nuclear superiority, then deterrence will break down and there is the possibility of an attack by the Soviet Union. In the next five years, I think it's possible to state almost statistically that, that the risk of nuclear war is quite considerable, precisely because of the imbalance in forces and the different perceptions of both sides. If we can get through to the 1990s, then I think the danger would recede. I believe that the incentive for all nuclear weapon states, in particular the major, the two major powers, to find a way of regulating their competition in the nuclear field. That incentive remains very powerful. I would expect that in the messy world of the future, with possibly other nuclear weapon states around, that incentive will grow even further. And so the two major countries responsible for the maintenance of deterrence will, I think, see, uh, find it almost inevitable uh, that they should sit down, they should try 
in dialogue and in agreements to regulate this relationship. Perhaps every five or ten years it should be required that all world leaders attend a, uh, a multi-megaton blast in the atmosphere. Uh, I think if they were to, let's say, strip down to their skivvies and would to feel the heat at a distance of some 20 or 30 miles, uh, they would appreciate a little better the enormity of the power which they have at their disposal, and I think that uh, once they realize this and continue to realize it the way I think our present world leaders do, uh, then I think we can count on the deterrence for a very long time. People talk about disarming, uh, destroying nuclear weapons. I think that is not the way to, to do it. I think there will be too much suspicion that the other guy will hide some missiles, hide some bombs, and thereby acquire uh, uh, supremacy of some kind when you disarm. So my belief is, let's stop the technological arms race. Let's not make any new weapons. Let's leave what we have alone and gradually even stop proof testing it. So those missiles will rot or corrode or whatever will you have it in the silos, and the submarines will become less and less safe to dive under the sea. And that kind of a obsolescence will make it less and less tempting to use or even to threaten to use these arsenals in case of, in time of political crisis. May the missiles then pass uneventfully from decrepit silos in distant fields to decent exposure in famous museums. And here in future times, the visitor will perhaps pause to wonder at our unromantic age, when great nations spoke plainly to one another only in the language of mutual extermination. But it's for the sake of those new generations that I trust we'll allow no other fears ever to surpass our fear of nuclear war. And think no effort of mind and heart too troublesome or too risky if the alternative is that our nuclear nightmares come to pass.